Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Assemblyman Carter. Present. Assemblyman DeLong. Present. Assemblyman De Silva. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Here. Assemblyman Gurr. Assemblyman Hibbets. Here. Assemblyman Koenig. Here. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Assemblyman Wynn. Here. Assemblywoman Taylor. Here. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Chair Torres. Welcome to the audience here in Carson City, the audience in Las Vegas, and those joining us via teleconference. Um, as a couple of reminders and housekeeping items, please silence your electronic devices. If you wish to testify, please sign in at the table by the door and provide a business card to the committee secretary. For those joining online, please be sure to mute your microphone when you are not speaking to minimize any background noise. When testify, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name and affiliation, if any, for the record. In addition, please spell your name for the record um, when you are speaking in public comment. Then turn the microphone off each time you are done speaking. Handouts, 20 hard copies for members of the public. Electronic copies should have been submitted to the committee manager by noon yesterday for members of the committee. We expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during the meeting, even if we may not agree with another person's position. Committee members will be using their laptops to view handouts and other documents. Please do not view this as a sign of disrespect or inattention. Uh, public comment will be taken at the end of the meeting. Each person will be limited to two minutes. In addition, the public may submit written testimony to the committee up to 24 hours after the hearing. Uh, today, we do have a couple items on the agenda. Uh, we will begin with the book presentations and then we will hear AB 82 after. Um, so we'll go ahead and begin with the Washoe County Sheriff's Office. And I believe we have Mr. Jason Walker, the Sergeant from the Administrative Division, as well as Ms. Mary Sarah Kinner, the Government Affairs Liaison. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is Jason Walker, J-A-S-O-N-W-A-L-K-E-R. Happily here to present an overview of the Washington County Sheriff's Office with my colleague, Mary Sarah Kinner. Uh, speaking of Washoe County, incorporates two main cities of Reno and Sparks, a few townships along the way, Incline Village, up to beautiful Lake Tahoe, Wadsworth, Via, Gerlach, which incorporates a Black Rock Desert, uh, home of the Burning Man Festival. And for those of you that have never been out there, the art installations that show up are amazing. If you get a chance to head out that way during the festival, it's definitely something to look at. The population for Washoe County, as I looked it up at the time, is 499,508 persons. That's a one and a third increase in the last year or so. We are a fifth of the size of Clark County. Washoe County was founded in 1861. It is the largest county, uh, second largest county in Nevada, encompassing 6,542 square miles. Our mission and vision statement for the Wash County Sheriff's Office, the vision statement is there. I will read you our mission statement. It is dedicated to preserving a safe and secure community with professionalism, respect, integrity, and the highest commitment to equality. Our core values are the acronym of PRIDE. Professionalism, respect, integrity, dedication, equality. Our motto is commitment to community. We are working on our 2023 through 2025 strategic plan. We will share those core values with you when they come out. About the Wash County Sheriff's Office, uh, we provide the law enforcement services for the unincorporated area of Washoe County. We are also responsible for operating the only adult detention facility for pretrial detainees and sentenced misdemeanants within Washoe County. The agency has an authorized strength of 443 commissioned 301 civilian, 60 intermittent hourly employees. The agency has approximately 422 dedicated individuals who donate their time to volunteer for programs such as search and rescue, community emergency response team, and Citizens Homeland Security Council. Our current annual operating budget is 131 and a half million with a little over 5 million in restricted funding such as grants and donations. Darren Balaam is the 27th person elected to serve as the Sheriff of Washoe County. He was sworn into office January 7th of 2019 and has since been re-elected to his second term. 
He has over 26 years of dedicated service to the Sheriff's Office, having served in all three bureaus. They are administration, detention, and operations. Sheriff Balaam is committed to enhancing mental health services for inmates at the, de uh, at the detention facility and formed our DSU, or Detention Services Unit, within his first year in office. He's committed to combating human exploitation and trafficking in our community. He, along with now retired Reno Police Chief Soto and Sparks Police Chief Crawforth, created the HEAT team. Their mission is to combat human and sex trafficking, which plagues our communities. The next slide is our uh, picture organizational chart with uh, Sheriff Balaam at the top. Next is Under Sheriff Clark, followed by our three chief deputies, Chief Deputy Jones, Caldwell, and Solferino with the captains that work below them. Continuing on with our command structure below the chief deputies, they have five captains who are responsible for the valley and incline patrols the detention facility, our special operations division, administration, and heading up also our police accountability and transparency. Those five captains have 15 lieutenants who have 45 sergeants who work with 358 deputy sheriffs who are the boots on the street. Um, next slide shows our uh, increasing in staffing levels that has trended upward since 2015. For 2022, our authorized commission staffing levels are 443. Uh, I believe our numbers for 2023 are adding an additional 15, making it 458. That's not an official number. We do have a state of the sheriff's office uh, robust report that's coming out. I believe it's sitting on the sheriff's desk right now with um, a lot more information on it. But as of 2023, I believe the number is going to be 458, which is that's exciting. There's always that old adage that there's never the police around when you need them. We're working to increase those numbers. Sharing with you some of our agency demographics, 79% are male, 21% are female. Ethnicity-wise, 81% are white, 11% 11, 11 of that's Hispanic, 4% Asian, 2.5% black, 1% American Indian, half a percent Pacific Islander. Dialing directly into the next slide, it shows the Washoe County demographics. 50.5% male, 49.5% female, and the ethnicities are listed below that. And what I like to compare these two is oftentimes people ask me, I'm the background sergeant, so I'm at the ground floor of initial contact. Do you want to come and work here? Is there something I can offer you? And I am pleased to say that our agency represents our community. We are hiring our community. It helps us to police our community as well. Um, we have a lot of efforts out there for recruitment. Uh, the sheriff is in about every community program that's out there, faith-based breakfasts, police symposiums. We bring the background group out there, and I, I would say nearly everybody that works at the agency participates in recruitment. I think that's one of the biggest things is it's easy to just say staffing levels, but uh, everybody at the agency works on recruitment as well as retention. And I'm happy to say that uh, our agency reflects the community that we work in. Uh, the first bureau that I'd like to highlight is our administrative bureau. That's run by Chief Deputy Jones. He's responsible for backgrounds, civil, community engagement, dispatch, the front desk, the NNLEA, which is the Northern Nevada Law Enforcement Academy, which is a regional academy, our OPI division, Office of Professional Integrity, our records division, R&D, which is research and development, and our training and compliance. A couple highlights for the administrative division, uh, re research and development. Going back a few years to 2017, uh, the 79th session, Senate Bill 176 authorized body-worn cameras. We rolled them out to our operations bureau that year. Two years later, we integrated Fleet 2, which is Axon brand uh, cameras into all our marked patrol vehicles. A couple years later, integrated the body-worn cameras to all commissioned detention personnel. So not only do we have them in the cars, we have them in the patrol people. We have them now downstairs as of 2021. For this year, uh, quarter two release, we're hoping to release Axon's latest version, which is Fleet 3. In a nutshell, it's going to ease uh, the video-based evidence dissemination, a more efficient workflow for the district attorneys and the PD's office. It assembles all videos, all interviews, all case information into one complete case. When we drop our probable cause sheet, everybody's already asking for the video. This helps us to compile all that information and put our best foot forward for decision making at that time. Next highlight that I'd like to bring up is our concealed carry uh, weapons permit. Um, 
total currently in process, we have 1,326. These stats are fiscal year 22, so it's July 1, 2021 through June 30, 2022. Uh, we've revoked 54, suspended zero, denied 44, reinstated 24. Out of those that are applied, 2,800-ish were male, 1,200-ish were female. Currently looking at 67 days to process a concealed carry permit. We report our crimes on what is called NIBRS, National Incident-Based Reporting System. Um, all the, most of the agencies in the area, the four that are listed there, work to update the software platform, Tiburon. This work included building code tables, adaptation of workflows, and state and Nevada mandated training for staff. The transition from summary or universal crime reporting to NIBRS reporting was August 1st of 2019. In December of that same year, we met that reporting criteria to NIBRS certifying our agency. The error, the margin error is less than 3%. For every incident that we report, the margin for error is 3%, and we hit that note. And our site certification helped the state attain FBI NIBR certification. Uh, the FBI transitioned to NIBRS only as of January 1. NIBRS collects more detailed information, provides a greater analytical flexibility for trends and analysis. A couple of our community outreach events, we have the Christmas in July. As of tw in 2022, 1,400 parents and children that have the greatest need in our community came to the Sheriff's Office fourth annual Christmas in July. We distributed 1,200 backpacks full of school supplies and hygiene items, fed nearly 1,400 people, gave out countless prizes for the carnival games. The record-breaking success of our annual event was a direct reflection of the kindness and generosity of people and organizations that do what it takes to realize a vision and make a positive difference in our community. The 2022 event was held at the Boys and Girls Club of the Truckee Meadows July 30th, 2022. Sponsored by, mainly by the Washoe County Honorary Deputy Association, community sponsors such as Walmart, AT&T Pioneers, the Ferrero Group, Cisco Food, Northern Nevada Dental Health, the KT Grace Foundation, the Fly High Trampoline Park, and of course the Boys and Girls Club of the Truckee Meadows. The estimated cash and donations were valued at nearly 25,000. The Honorary Deputies Associated donated an additional 7,000 towards their successes. Another big outreach event for us is the Chop with the Sheriff event. The Washoe County Sheriff's Office and Honorary Deputies Association asked the school district and nonprofit agencies to identify children who have the greatest need in our community to participate. The 2022 Shop of the Sheriff event was the 20th annual, taking place December 6th at a local Walmart. Just in time for Christmas, the Shop of the Sheriff event pairs children who are referred by the school district with the Sheriff's Office and community volunteers for a holiday shopping spree. As in years past, we will work with our organizations to select students aged 5 to 12 to participate in future events. Lastly, I'd like to highlight our No Shave campaign. In exchange for a monthly charitable donation between the months of October and January, Sheriff Balaam relaxes grooming standards to allow for facial hair for male deputies, and female deputies are allowed to have relaxed hair standards. Civilian support uh, can wear hats, jeans, sports jerseys. Since we started this in 2016, the Sheriff has donated over 100000 towards a variety of serving local charities. Next, highlighting our Detention Bureau headed by Chief Deputy Caldwell. A uh, few of the things that uh, falls under that umbrella is our alternatives to incarceration, our inmate assistance program, our second judicial district court bailiffs, our court transportation staff, our DSU, which is the detention services unit, our DRT, detention response team, IMU, inmate management program, as well as the programs that operate within the facility. Main thing I'd like to highlight is our detention services unit. Uh, they operate with a medically assisted treatment program, one of 12 accredited, offering state social services, discharge planners, local social services, grant funded advocate, veterans unit, and just highlighting a couple programs, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcohol Anonymous, uh, Addiction, Mental Health, and Anger Management. Sharing a few of our stats from 2022, our average daily population is up to 1,241 inmates. Our length of stay averaged uh, January of last year to May of last year is up to just under 24 days length of stay. Bookings totaled a little over 16,000. And our average uh, 
cost per day for inmate ranges from 126 to about 180. And the reason why it fluctuates, wintertime, it's colder downstairs, they might need a thermal, they might need an additional blanket. Uh, we're factoring about 126 per inmate per day who uh, have a standard of care of up to about 500 depending on programming, uh, medical needs, some that need a little bit more could, could uh, top up to 800. Also within the detention facilities are Wash County uh, Multiplex. When COVID hit and courts were shut down, that has to continue. We created video court connections with the courts listed, Incline Village Justice Court, Reno and Sparks Justice Courts, Wadsworth Justice Court, Reno and Sparks Muni Courts, Federal Court, Tribal Courts. They operate four courtrooms, the red, pink, uh, or, sorry, red, pink, green, and blue arrangement rooms. There's eight individual video court stations. There's iPads available for use within the housing units for the inmates. A few of our transportation statistics. These are inmates going, uh, top line inmates going to district court appearances only. Uh, you can see that pre-COVID, we were about 6,000 trended down during the, the heat of COVID, now trending back up in 2022 at 4,828, just district court appearances. Total court events through all other jurisdictions are listed below. Again, pre-COVID, trending down during COVID, and for 2022, we're trending back upwards. The uh, court transportation staff is very busy moving uh, inmates back and forth. Next, highlighting our operations bureau, which is headed up by Chief Deputy Solferino. He's responsible for our investigations division, which is our detectives, patrol, our mate team, major accident investigation team, our Marine 9 Division, which is the boat asset up at Incline Village, our Motor Division, our EOD, which is our Bomb Techs, Extradition, Hostage Team, K-9, Interdiction Task Force, our Regional Information Center is INRIC, Raven, which is our helicopter assets, RGU, which is the Regional Gang Unit, Search and Rescue for uh, SWAT, as, uh, as far as uh, another regional team. A highlight from our Operations Bureau is our dispatch staff includes police, fire, and EMS dispatch. Uh, quick search uh, came up with 106,270 106, entries. Of those, police dispatch calls for service were 17,080. Officer initiated were 42,970, totaling about 60,000 calls for service annually. The officer initiated are traffic stops, vehicle checks, park checks, so on and so forth. Uh, that falls under our regional initiative. Uh, with our INRIC umbrella, there's other teams that are there, the Crime Suppression Unit, Reno and Sparks, our Narcotics Unit, our HEAT Team. SONU is a Sex Offender Notification Unit, and our ICAC Division is the Internet Crimes Against Children. When they fall under that INRIC umbrella, what that means is it's one thing for the Wash County Sheriff's Office to have a piece of information, but what we do as a region is we share that with all those other individuals that tie into that. It's, it's best if we all have the same information as a region. Uh, our patrol division is working on a stratified policing model. What that means is we, it's intelligence-led policing that's place-based, person-focused, problem-solving, community-based, all into one methodology. It's real-time analytics. We look at repeat calls for service. We look at significant incidents. We look at crime patterns, problem locations, and problem areas. Uh, just touching on one area, uh, uh, a popular trailhead in town. People would go out, be nice, it's spring day, they want to go on a hike. Uh, their cars are getting broken into. We looked at that and analyzed that with our stratified policing. We decided, let's put the police there at a certain amount of time when we know these crimes are occurring. That did have an effect on that. The next slide shows the top up, bottom down uh, thought process to it. Accountability wise, we get incidents every once in a while. When it becomes a significant incident, we look at it. If it becomes a repeat incident, we look at it. It starts with the deputies, supervisors, and as the problems are assigned, the accountability is assigned. I can tell you as a sergeant, I have yet to get it up to a commander, captain, or executive staff level. We, we, uh, we put some thought process into it and try and uh, knock it in the bud uh, before it raises up an accountability. Next, I'd like to highlight our search and rescue operations. These are our volunteer hours that totaled 4,981 volunteer hours with a savings of 333,000. 
Um, those search and rescue people uh, do some tremendous things. They have a lot of skills, a lot of abilities, and a lot of equipment that get us out of a lot of a lot of stuff. Uh, along the that goes with the search and rescue is generally they get deployed off a rope off the helicopter for a rappelling or something along that. Raven goes out there, 63 requests for service for Raven, 43 responses totaling 255 flight hours for Raven. That is a tremendous asset. Uh, lastly, but not least, is our mighty Forensic Science Division. They provide services for 13 of the 17 counties in Nevada and Central Nevada, and one county in California. Local, state, federal, and tribal agencies are within these counties. Scopes of services provided are breath alcohol calibration, controlled substances, crime scenes, DNA, firearms, print processing and comparison, and toxicology of alcohol and drugs. Since 2020, they've analyzed 979 cases, responded to 83 homicides, reduced turnaround times on firearms, and reported uh, 157 latent print database hits. They change our drug testing policy to test for drugs, even in cases with high alcohol contents. That's that poly DUI, where you can smell the alcohol on them, you can see the signs and symptoms of alcohol consumption, but now we're testing for also if they have any uh, illegal drug substances on board. That concludes my presentation. Uh, Mary Sarah. Good morning, Chairwoman and Committee. My name is Mary Sarah Kinner, M-A-R-Y hyphen S-A-R-A-H-K-I-N-N-E-R. And I'm just pleased to be here with Sergeant Walker to help answer any questions that uh, we might be able to answer for you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your presentation. I now stand in, we stand open for any questions, members, Assemblyman Gonzalez, anybody else, and then Assemblyman Hivitz, and then Assemblywoman Thomas. Okay, got it. Um, go ahead. Thank you so much, Chair. <clears throat> Uh, Cecilia Gonzalez, District 16, for the record, good morning. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, Chair, if you don't mind, I have just a few questions. Um, so number one, I was wondering if the committee was able to get a breakdown of the gender and race of your incarcerated population in Washoe, because I didn't see that on the slide. Um, do you want me to just ask them all and then, okay. And then the second question, um, what are you all doing to diversify your workforce? Um, on the first, or the slide where you broke down your race by the department, um, I saw that Latinos are only 11% of the population, but in Washoe County, they actually represent closer to 25 or 26% of the pop overall population, right? So I was just curious what you're doing to diversify. Um, and then the last question I have, um, what has Washoe County done over the last two years to implement or putting social workers at intake? Thank you so much. The data breakdown, just the most current data that you have in terms of your incarcerated population and gender and race. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Jason Walker. Um, timing was not on my side. We have just compiled a robust uh, state of the sheriff's office, uh, approximate 80 page report from all divisions, all those numbers. I have heard that they're sitting on the sheriff's desk currently, uh, not signed off yet. There will be a press release. I will happily share that information in copy form or in an email when I get that, as I believe that that is um, important stats. Uh, a lot of the meetings that I've been to is that, show me the numbers. Why is this? Why is that? Uh, I can tell you uh, with certainty, the ones that are in the jail, they're there for a reason. Um, the ones that have met Valdez Jimenez, they're able to get out from other services. The ones that can be out are out. Um, I will get you that information as far as diversifying our, um, the workers that are there. Um, we're out all the time and we're talking to all the groups, police symposium, we're going out to uh, Fallon Naval Air Base, we're hitting those um, community engagement efforts to include UNR and all that. Uh, I think our best recruiter is the people that are working there. Um, I couldn't tell you having been the sergeant of the backgrounds division now for a year, the majority of the apps that we get are somebody that knows somebody and they have that friend that's out there. Um, 
the sheriff is in the police symposium. He's out with the faith-based breakfast and all that, and he's pushing it to get that diversity out there. And I think, um, you know, by showing that we do hire our community, I think that's a big deal. Um, social workers and intake was the last question. I don't have an answer on that. I will circle back with you on that. I do know that they go through a series of screening questions as they move through the intake process, but I don't have a specific answer for you. Uh, I have it noted, and I will certainly follow up with you on that. And I think oftentimes that that's probably the most important to get the information out of them right from the very beginning. So I can understand that. Although having worked in intake as a deputy and supervised an intake, some of the people that come in are under the influence of something. They're irritated just from being in the jail, and they might not put out the proper response that we need to get them down that lane that they need to go to. But I, I will follow up with you on that. Thank you for the question. Thank you. And I, I will say um, I have heard some phenomenal things about the intake process using social workers as well. Um, and it seems like it really is like the gold standard of how we should be intaking individuals, not just pushing individuals into incarceration. So uh, it sounds I, we would definitely love more information if we can get it. Uh, Assemblyman Hibbets. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you list your authorized strength of 443 commissioned personnel. How many do you have? According to my colleague, she says we're fully staffed. You would be one of very few agencies in this entire country uh, if that is true. Well, uh, what I can I tell you, what I can tell you with certainty, having worked in the backgrounds division again for a year, uh, Sheriff Balaam told me, "Walk, get me 25 for this academy, give me 15 for the this academy coming up would be July. Next academy coming up would be January." He says, "After that January, he's probably going to be a name for every FTE that's on our books." Um, what the one thing that I can't factor in is retirements. A lot of times people hold that close to them. Um, they, uh, we don't know when people are going to go. Generally, it's a July or a January just because. Um, I, I'm proudly going to say that we're, we're close to being staffed. It came up in another meeting where somebody says, how do you do it? I, there's no direct answer how Washoe County does what we, does. It, what we do. It, it could very much be the diversity of the work. Uh, somebody could amass a 30-year career and, and do 10 jobs for three years. And the, the staff, the, uh, there's a lot of factors that, pl that play into that, but we're, we're close to fully staffed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman Thomas. Good morning, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to start off by saying good for you. I love the idea that Washaw County, and I wish that every other department could do the same or county could do the same thing, is recruit from your own. You know, this to me is a big thing. I've always asked, you know, why aren't we doing more of that? Community, um, instead of, you know, hiring people from Valdesta, Georgia, I don't have anything against Valdesta, but, you know, hey, you know, police our own. Um, that's my comment, but I have a question, I do. Um, you had mentioned video, and I was wondering if that's free to the public, or do you charge for a video of, uh, you, know, um, you know, to attorneys and or uh, common folk? Thank you for the question. That's all free. And I apologize. Would you be able to make, state your name for the record? Jason Walker. Thank you for the question. That's all free. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Assemblywoman Taylor. Thank you, Chair, and good morning. Good morning. It's always a little extra special when the Washoe people come, so for obvious reasons. But um, gr um, um, great information shared from the from the, the sheriff's office. I mean, I've obviously I've, I've, I've been there and seen uh, some of the great work that's been done, um, particularly by the sheriff. Um, and he he actually told me about the I talked to him last night for, at something, and he told me the report was coming. Make sure you look for it, okay? Um, but uh, he's he's I will certainly say he is definitely out and about as a sheriff. Um, he is very open 
um, whenever I've reached out to him with a question, a challenge, a concern, and they're, they haven't all been nice and fuzzy conversations, but he's always very, very good about that. Um, and so, I, you know, I believe in, in um, I believe that he believes in the work of the community, and I, and I think that's, that, that speaks for itself. Um, I will say that, um, just to follow up a little bit um, from my, um, my colleague's comment, um, uh, Assemblywoman um, Gonzalez, I will just talk a little bit more about the diversity piece in it, because I know you're going to be getting some numbers, and it may already be in the sheriff's report. And so if you can just take a look and see and give us specifically what the command staff looks like. Um, I, there, there has been some growth, again, and I, I want to go and commend that. Um, but just see, what, what does the command staff, staff look like from a diversity standpoint? And then can you talk a little bit for, for myself and, and actually for the panel, um, for the committee as well, what your hiring process looks like? What it, what it look like? What are those steps? How, how does one say, oh, yeah, great, I'd love to be a part of the sheriff's office. What does that, what does that look like? Thank you for the question, Jason Walker. It starts with an it, HR less uh, opening and opening for either lateral deputy sheriff or deputy sheriff recruit lateral is somebody that has a post certification from either Nevada or another state so it just starts with somebody dialing into Washoe County to see the sheriff's office has uh, they're accepting applications um, our opening for applications has been wide open for many years which very well could be why we're getting as many apps as we're getting so it starts with the application process then it moves into um, human resources, accepts the application. You, you put in all the information, uh, your, your biographical information, you do meet the minimum standards to apply for this position. Then they throw them out a link to take a written test. You pass a written civil service test. Once you're past that, then you go to what's called their post-physical readiness test. It's a series of runs, push-ups, uh, sit-ups, um, a sprint and agility course. So you have to pass that PPRT as well. Once the application written and uh, PPRT are completed, it goes from HR to us. Once we get it at the sheriff's office, what we do is we get a certified list from HR again with these three um, processes have been done. Here's my list of 30 potential applicants or 30 potential deputy sheriff recruits. Once the backgrounds division gets them, we send them um, the, the name of the uh, computer program is called ESOF, Electronic Statement of Personal History, but we send them what we call a PIQ, Pre-Investigative Questionnaire. It's 15 questions. What that PIQ helps us to do is triage applications. And what I mean by that is one background investigation could range from 40 to maybe 90 hours to complete to put somebody in an academy. What that PIQ does, and we have mandatory rejection criteria based off NAC standards, has to do with time and distance from drugs, time and distance from arrests. That PIQ allows us to triage those apps. Once we knock, um, if we have a rejection criteria, we have to just respond to them and say, uh, based off this, uh, we're not able to look at your application, please reapply at a certain date and time. But the ones that do pass that rejection criteria, we send them the link for the ESOF, and that is hours and hours and hours of information that needs to come to us before we start the background investigation, bank references, uh, address references, work references, personal references. We tie all that together. Uh, we bring them in for a face-to-face -face interview, and then we put them on what's called a CVSA, computerized voice stress analysis. It's one thing to say something or write something, but we just confirm that what they're saying is the most accurate information. At that point, we send them to the hiring board. The background's job is done at that point. I provide the hiring board with the information. These applications look great. And the hiring board, which is two chiefs, they make the hiring decision at that point. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Chair, may I have a follow-up, please? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, then part of the reason for the question is that it's very detailed, so thank you. And I, 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 admit, I saw that you didn't, you know, there was a time in, in law enforcement when there was a, a, a big focus on a psychological exam, um, which it, it and I did, you didn't mention that you guys still have that. I'm sorry, we still do a psyche eval and that. And I apologize, our name for the record every time. Thank you. I know it's fun. <laughs> Go, no, please, go ahead. Jason Walker, we still do a psyche valve. Yes, okay, oh, so you do, okay. Um, yeah, because, you know, there's, there's um, if I may continue. 
Yes. Thank you. Um, and I was wondering that because there's some research that really looks at sometimes that um, that can disproportionately um, um, exclude people of color. And so that's why um, it's um, so just, just that's why I wanted to know if that's there because that might be part of um, um, you've done you've done a good job in a lot of the areas. That may be some of the things that may be in a, a barrier for 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 our Hispanic um, officers. And then finally, just a recommendation acronyms. Next time, can you spell those out? Jason Walker. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Assemblyman Carter. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I do have two questions. I'll ask for a follow-up. But first off, following in the same line, so you mentioned laterals. How many laterals come in in proportion to locals? And in that same vein, is there any type of system to um, give locals of the service area a leg up, so to speak, over laterals or people from outside of the community? Jason Walker, thank you for the question. I don't have an exact percentage wise, but what I can tell you is that we're getting laterals in like they're going out of style. Whether we have a better program or not uh, could have to do with the pay, could have to do with the ability to work in the jail. Um, the jail is 70 degrees, 365 days a year, and it, it's either nine degrees outside in the wintertime or 110 in the summertime. Um, our program may look better. I could tell you uh, a, an exact number right now, we're looking at five laterals that are on our board, and they're all within the, uh, I'm sorry, four of them are within the great state of Nevada. One of them is post-certified out of California. When we pick up a lateral from the state of Nevada, their, their Nevada post is already set. When somebody comes from another state, what they have to do is challenge post. And we have in the past hired them, given them a final offer, they come to work for us, they work up in the training office. We uh, uh, get with post and they open up that challenge course. They sit there and they do, and don't quote me on this, it's at least three weeks of coursework before they're ready for the test then they challenge that post test. So from a business standpoint, the leg up does go to the in-state because they don't have to challenge post. They already have the, the Nevada post. Did that answer your question, sir? Actually, no. <laughs> what I was trying to figure out and wanted to hear based on what Claire complimented you on is what the Washoe County Sheriff's Department is doing to develop locals to be people, we talk about this, you know, officers are servants of the community. I'm a firm believer that you need to be a part of the community before you can serve the community and that our forces should be developing that skill set within the community before it gets up there. I'm not a big fan of laterals. I think that we need to develop our own. But that was what I was asking, is what we're doing to create servants within our community public services jason walker and just to follow up on that i'm sorry for the misunderstanding on the initial question what i can tell you is that sheriff balaam authorizes uh, deputies to adopt schools in the area and what they do is go out and, and we're talking not just college level we're talking elementary school um just from my experience, when you get somebody at that high school, college level, they're already in a certain lane and they know what they want to do. But by sending these deputies out there to be that law enforcement liaison with a particular school, it sets that standard. They, they see, and I'll just give them props, they see Deputy D. Metropolis. He works for me. He has adopted a school, common spelling, D. Metropolis, by the way. He uh, has adopted a school and he's done that for years and years and years. And you can go and ask those kids and they're youngsters. What do you want to do when you grow up? I want to go work with Deputy Demo. So we have those officers that are out there that are talking to those little kids and getting out there for those community engagement events and throwing the flyers out there at the younger age to help develop those people. And then a different ladder, different way. Um, what is your response time or pickup time on your 311 system? Wait time?
Thank you for your question, Mayor Sarah Kinner. I don't have an answer for that right now, but happy to get you one. Thank you. Do you know, like, even just like a, like, just like a ballpark, uh, just because I know in Southern Nevada, I've actually heard a number of complaints about waiting like three hours to get to three. Like, do you know, like, generally under 30 minutes or anything like that? Mary Sarah Kinner, unfortunately, I'm sorry I don't today, but happy to get you an answer this afternoon. Thank you. You're I appreciate welcome. that. Thank you. And Vice Chair Duran? Okay. Thank you for your presentation. And yes, I am. I'm with um, Assemblywoman Taylor on the acronyms. I'm like, I was trying to write them down as I was going, but that uh, would be um, f um, great for us to have. Again, so I was just wondering, how does your office interact with ICE? Or do you have any affiliation with that department? Jason Walker, we work with them every day. Um, when I was uh, working as the intake sergeant and intake deputy, there's, a, there's an officer with ICE that sits there at the desk. So we work with them every day. So when you have a person that's basically on that, do you release information for them? Because from my understanding, that's supposed to be a separate entity. Jason Walker, I don't have an answer for you on that, ma'am. If we can get some information on that, please. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any other additional questions? All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thanks for making the time today. We do have one more presentation from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Today we're going to be, have a presentation from Ms. Beth Schmidt, the Director of Police, uh, Director and Police Sergeant, as well as Police Detective Adrian Hunt and Police Detective Christopher, I believe, Rice, Reese? Reese. Reese, thank you. I appreciate it. And you may begin when you're ready. Okay, we're ready. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Torres, Vice Chair Duran, and members of the Assembly Government Affairs for inviting us to speak today. For the record, my name is Beth Schmidt, B-E-T-H-S-C-H-M-I-D-T, and I am the Director of Intergovernmental Services for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. With me today are Detectives Adrian Hunt and Chris Reese. LVMPD is one of the largest police agencies in the United States. Our mission is to provide exceptional police services in partnership with the community. We want to stress that phrase, in partnership with the community, because we recognize as a law enforcement agency we cannot be effective in working exclusively on our own. Our success can only be achieved through collaboration, by building strong relationships and partnering with individuals groups, and organizations throughout our community. We police 7,560 square miles in Southern Nevada. We are responsible for ensuring the safety of 1.7 million residents and 3.9 million tourists who visit our community annually. The LVMPD uses commissioned officers as our lobbyist because we speak from positions of experience and knowledge when it comes to policing and corrections. As the director, I am on executive staff. This is my 14th year with the agency. I have served as a sergeant, a detective, and an officer. Adrian, uh, detective Adrian Hunt, to my left, your right, is in his 17th year with the LVMPD. He spent 13 years as a corrections officer with us and has been a police officer for four years. Detective Chris Reese, to my right, your left, is in his 14th year with the LVMPD. Our sheriff, Kevin McMahill was sworn in last month as the eighth elected sheriff of the LVMPD. Prior to becoming our sheriff, he dedicated 30 years to our organization, rising to the role of undersheriff for then sheriff Joe Lombardo. He retired from the LVMPD in 2020, and in 2022, he successfully ran for and won the sheriff of Clark County race. Sheriff Kevin McMahill's number one priority is to inject more humanity into our policing model. And what do we mean by that? 
Well, history shows us that police agencies and cities and counties don't improve neighborhoods by arresting their way out of the problem. If we want to improve public safety and quality of life, police agencies need to inject more humanity into how we treat the people we are allowed to serve. After all, we derive our power from our community. As an agency, we're moving away from labeling neighborhoods as problems and crime hotspots. Instead, we see them for what they are. They are vulnerable communities. And we are asking ourselves how we, as a police department, can create dramatically different outcomes and create lasting relationships moving forward. Another priority of our sheriff is, to, is the establishment of a wellness bureau. And the intent of the bureau is to care for our employees' physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Our mission is to bring together police, fire, and EMS with the goal of taking care of them in a profoundly different way. We believe that with this approach, we will be able to serve our community with a deeper sense of understanding and care. The LVMPD is celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. We were created in 1973 when the Nevada legislature voted to merge the Clark County Sheriff's Office with the Las Vegas Police Department. Historically, most police departments are funded by cities and sheriff's departments are funded by counties. LVMPD is a hybrid among law enforcement agencies. The LVMPD is funded by NRS 280. This dictates that the Fiscal Affairs Committee provides oversight and approval of all LVMPD fiscal issues except for the detention center budget. Our budget for this year is $1.4 billion. 35% of our budget is self-generated from property and sales taxes. The remaining 65% is split between Clark County and the city of Las Vegas based on a formula that utilizes population, calls for service, and felony crimes. We employ 5,800 employees. 4,000 of these employees are commissioned officers. 3,100 of them are police officers, and 900 of them are corrections officers in the jail. So that means that 1,800 of our additional employees are civilians. 33% of all of our employees are female. 15% of our commissioned employees, meaning our police officers and corrections officers, are female. One of the greatest challenges, one of our greatest challenges, is recruitment and retention, which are nationwide challenges in policing. This is both, both for us, it is both on the commissioned and the civilian sides. And one of our approaches to improving recruitment is to continue to build bridges in the Las Vegas Valley, especially in our communities of color, because we still remain challenged in filling our ranks with non-white officers. We're looking, one of the things we're looking for is to find ways to bridge that gap between the ages of 18 and 21 so that young men and women in our community can grow and develop both an interest and skill sets that will make them strong candidates for the LVMPD. This map shows our jurisdiction and the colors show the 10 different area commands that we have. In addition to this vast area, we are also responsible for Harry Reid International Airport. Now, every one of these 10 area commands has what is known as a community-oriented poli community policing squad. You may hear that referred to as a COP squad. And we also have crime prevention specialists in each of these 10 area commands to serve our neighborhoods. We have other bureaus and divisions that include canine, search and rescue. We have our own forensic lab. We have crime scene investigators. We also house the Southern Nevada Counterterrorism Center, which serves as the state of Nevada's fusion center. We have a real-time crime center that utilizes real-time analytics and technology to help us solve crimes. An example of this would be recently one of our real-time camera operators located bank robbers that we had been looking for. 
and they had robbed nine banks in 20 days, and they were using stolen vehicles. So we were having a lot of difficulty finding them. The camera op operator was able to locate them in a vehicle and guide our officers to the robbers, and they were taken into custody. This is just one example of how we successfully use technology at the LVMPD. Our goal for 2023 is to reduce overall crime in Las Vegas by 10%. Last year, our jurisdiction saw a 6% drop, 6% drop in homicides and an overall reduction in violent crime of 4%. Among the major cities in the United States, the average murder solvability rate is 51%. That means that in the, most of the major cities in the United States, 49% of the murders that are committed in their jurisdiction don't get solved. We are proud to say that the LVMPD's homicide section leads the nation among major cities when it comes to solving murders. In 2021, we solved nearly 94% of our homicides in Las Vegas, 94%. And 89% of our homicides last year and many of those investigations are still continuing from 2022. And we expect as those investigations come to a close, we expect that solvability, that murder solvability number to rise to between 92 and 94%. Solvability rates matter. The LVMPD has demonstrated a continuous effort to learn and improve since the US Department of Justice worked with us on collaborative reform in 2012. Under then Sheriff Doug Gillespie, we voluntarily stepped up and agreed to a deep dive of our uses of deadly force. As a result of this collaborative reform, LVMPD is considered as a national model in reducing officer-involved shootings. Our use of force policy changed then, and it is continually updated as we learn through our reviews of incidents that happen here and nationwide. In 2014, we voluntarily participated in a body-worn camera pilot program. I personally stepped up and, uh, and volunteered to wear a camera. And consequently, the LVMPD became the first major police department to wear body-worn cameras. As an agency, we're consistently ahead of the curve when it comes to police reform. How are we ahead of the curve? Well, the way that we release information to the media, including our transparency and our accountability, we are the only police department in the country that releases a video with preliminary details of an officer-involved shooting. And we follow that up with a live media briefing 72 hours after a critical incident. In addition, we employ a dual model of investigating these critical incidents through our force investigation team and our critical incident review team. There is further particip participation in this process from the community in the form of citizen use of force review board members. De-escalation is a critical component of our policing model. Our officers have a duty to intervene with no retaliation. And we stress the importance of monitoring subjects and immediately summoning medical attention if required. We hold our supervisors accountable and we expect them to be involved in the management of our overall response to potentially violent encounters. The Clark County Detention Center, or CCDC, is funded 100% by the Clark County General Fund. CCDC is composed of two facilities. On an average day, we house 2,800 men and women Last year, we processed 52,000 bookings. CCDC is a county jail, and I'll just quickly explain the difference between a jail and a prison. An individual is housed in prison if they have been sentenced to more than a year for their crime. A jail typically houses individuals who are serving less than a one-year sentence. In the case of CCDC, most of our inmates are awaiting trial or sentencing. The Clark County Detention Center we are not proud to say this, but it is a reality. It is the largest mental health facility, the largest addiction treatment center, and the largest homeless center in the state of Nevada. 
We know that incarceration doesn't fix mental health, addiction, or homelessness. Sheriff McMahill's intention is for the LVMPD to do as much as we can to help our vulnerable citizens who are struggling with mental health, addiction, and homelessness. And two months into his tenure, we are already working in partnership with the City of Las Vegas, Clark County, and other stakeholders to solve what people claim are unsolvable problems. We know this is a heavy lift, but through leadership and partnership, we believe we can affect change in Clark County. But we can't solve these problems without help from the community. And one of the hallmarks of our agency is the way we build relationships and conduct community outreach. Community engagement is a tenant of our agency. Our Office of Community Engagement promotes prevention, education, support, and redirection. Our homeless outreach team's mission is to partner with community providers to identify those alternatives to arrest and challenges to reduce homelessness. Some of our other outreach is conducted through youth outreach, faith-based programs, First Tuesdays, Coffee with a Cop, our Citizens Police Academy, and our Hispanic Citizens Police Academy. And I want to highlight what we call MMAC, and I will spell out the acronym. It is Metro's Multicultural Advisory Council. For 20 years, this diverse group of community members has listened to the public safety concerns of our community and worked with LVMPD to strategize on how we improve policies and police procedures within the organization. MMAC members represent our diverse community, including Hispanics, African Americans, Asian Americans, Arab Americans, the LGBTQIA community, the ACLU, the Anti-Defamation League, and the NAACP. Some of the current challenges that MMAC is helping our agency address are recruitment, mental health awareness, homelessness, substance abuse, and the reduction of youth violence and homicide. The LBMPD remains committed to ensuring that all citizens of Southern Nevada feel safe, supported, and proud of their police department. Thank you, Chair Torres. Thank you. Members, any questions? I have a lot of questions. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Assemblyman De Silva, and then I'm going to go to Assemblyman Wynn, and then Assembly, uh, and then I'll tell you all later. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, again uh, for your great presentation. This is this was very informative and uh, very much needed. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the, f the first question is is pertaining. Uh, actually, before I even ask the question, I want to really uh, commend uh, uh, Officer Hunt here, Detective Hunt who a few years back uh, helped me out with a very uh, tense situation we had at Rancho High School dealing with the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, this real need for the students to have a conversation. There was a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, apprehension from administrators uh, in order to for us even host this sort of a, a community conversation on our campus after school. But uh, Detective Hunt was able to help me and we had an excellent conversation where we had representatives of uh, law enforcement as well as folks from the local uh, uh, New Era and Black Panther Party in the same room with our young people and had one of the most fruitful sort of civil discourses I've ever seen uh, young high schoolers involved with. So I, just, I really want to thank you for that, uh, Officer Hunt. It's great to see that you are also now part of this, uh, this lobbying team here uh, for this legislative session. And that really leads into my second uh, question. Uh, I didn't see too much here about the youth engagement and the, and the sort of uh, programs that Metro has pertaining directly with the youth. This is a big issue right now. We see what's going on in, in the news currently. Uh, with uh, law enforcement vis-a-vis -vis our young people. And I was wondering if you could uh, uh, discuss uh, some of the, uh, the youth-oriented programming uh, or even goals that you may have uh, here uh, in the near future. Thank you. Adrian Hunt, for the record. Thank you, Assemblyman. Um, yes, so I'm a firm believer. I'm a product of the city of Las Vegas. I grew up in the city. Um, I'm a firm believer in what they see is Detective what they'll Hunt, be. if you could just make sure you state your name for oh. the record. For the record, Adrian Hunt, A-D-R-I-A-N-H-U-N-T. Yeah. 
I'm a firm believer in what they see is what they'll be. Um, so I think that's one of the pivotal things that we need to have you know, across the nation in law enforcement is just mentoring the youth. Um, a lot of, you know, the older folk that stuck in their ways. So we got to get, with, you know, to the young folk. Um, so I definitely run a program and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that it's been a program that's been thriving throughout our department. It's called DREAM, which stands for Discover, Redirect, Empower, Advocate, and Mentor. And the program pretty much consists of a 12-week program of just mentoring youth. Um, we work with personal development. We work with interactive activities. And it's, it's the, the amazing thing is when you start, a lot of, of course, the youth, they're apprehensive of law enforcement. And about when they're when they're pretty much done with the program, they're asking questions like, "Oh, how can I be an officer?" So I think it's really a great, um, um, a, a really a great program to pretty much where we get to humanize the badge as well and show the kids that we're human just like like you guys. We love the same music, we love the same things, hobbies. So um, that's one of the programs that's really been thriving for our agency. Um, we also have um, a, um, a pretty much at headquarters we have a section. Um, which pretty much is outreach for our youth. And I've worked with Officer Arnold Parker many times in going into high schools, talking to kids in regards to just life choices. So we're definitely out there as an agency. We're progressive, getting out there, trying to work with our youth, and um, pretty much trying to bridge that gap. So um, I know it's been two area commands now, the, um, the program dream. The plan is to expand it to all area commands, all 10. So we look forward to that in the future. Thank you, Detective Hunt. And a matter of fact, I had my second question. Really? Yeah, everyone, really? if we could go as quick as possible, if you okay. could try to get all questions on the record in okay. that first question, that'd be great. But go ahead this one time. So okay. So. Got you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And my second question is pertaining to the, the Northeast Area Command. In this room, actually, uh, you have your whole delegation, uh, including uh, uh, Assemblywoman Mosca, who just uh, walked in here for a presentation. I think the only person missing is uh, Assemblyman Yurik. But uh, there's been there have been some conversations about getting officers out uh, on the on the streets, walking the streets, the beat, so to speak. I know this is something that we see commonplace in cities like. New York, uh, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago, even Los Angeles. I was wondering if there's any sort of efforts being made by uh, Metro, particularly in the Northeast uh, part of town. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Beth Schmidt, for the record. Thank you for, for bringing, that, uh, bringing that up. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is just the vast area that we cover. Um, and what we, what we realize is that you need to have police out there in neighborhoods that are vulnerable before problems happen. It, 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 we're very good as an agency of getting out there, and most police agencies are, when, when there has been a crime, there has been something that's happened, that responsiveness. What we are trying to do is to incorporate more of exactly what you're saying, which is getting out ahead of the curve, developing the relationships, and having worked as a community policing sergeant, I can tell you that that is where we do our best work is when I can get those officers out there, get out of your cars. It's something that we as a, as a supervisory group and as leaders, what we're always pushing is get out of your car. You, you need to talk to people. We need to interact. Just as humans, we need to interact. So that is something that, yes, we have a new captain that is over, I think it's been about two months now that Captain uh, Roberts has been over the Northeast Area Command and those and that direction and those conversations are, are, are being had with our officers and our supervisors. If I can add real quick, Adrian Hunt for the record, we also have COP teams, our community oriented policing teams, and they are specifically um, geared to go out to communities and areas that are vulnerable and, and give resources. You know, and, you know, we do things like um, in the neighborhoods of uh, Coffee with a Cop. We do things, pa uh, pause, uh, pause for Patrol. We also do engagement um, with the youth of um, Ice Cream with a Cop. So we'll pretty much, you know, hire an ice cream vendor and just have them come out and hang out and, and eat ice cream with us. So these are some of the things that our COP teams are doing out, out in the city. Thank you. Assemblyman Nguyen. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, thank you so much for the presentation. Just kudos to you for being very precise and have a lot of great points that we can uh, take notes on. So thank you for that, Sergeant. Um, my question is, um, we were looking for the stats that you have on the demographic of your force, uh, you know, uniform and civilian um, 
staff members in terms of the the diversity that we have there in Clark County. Uh, I'm so proud to serve my District 8 where 38% of our residents are API. I was just wondering if you have um, that um, answer in your, I didn't see it in the slides, but um, the demographic of, of the uh, 5,800 uh, folks in Metro. Um, and then the second part of that question is that uh, if you have folks with language, language capability in those um, hard to find um, languages um, outside of uh, his, uh, outside of the um, Latino community. So just want to see if you have those stats. Thank you. Beth Schmidt for the record. Thank you, Simonman, for that question. Yes, um, we are, our force right now is 54% white, 22% Hispanic, 9.5% black, 6.5% Asian, 5.8% identify as two or more races, 1.6% Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, and 0.6% American Indian, Alaskan Native. We know we have work to do. We know that. Um, I'm very pleased in talking to one of our recruiting sergeants recently, and he told me that our one of the recent, it may be the most recent uh, academy class that we have is 50% Hispanic. Uh, what we're seeing too is that we need to find ways to also attract more women. And my experience as a woman and as one of the leaders on the Women of Metro, which is a group that we, we try and mentor. And, we, and one of the things that we're doing is, you know, we have on our business cards Every single person has the QR code, which takes you to our recruitment site. Everybody's a recruiter, and we, we know we have work to do. We know that. Um, and we are, historically, agencies tend to look elsewhere. And Sheriff McMahon is saying, we need, we need to look internally. We need, or it, within the valley, within the state. We need to look in our community, and, and to Assemblyman Carter's point, that we, we need people who, who come out of our community, but how do you do that? It doesn't just magically happen. We have to put in the work to do that. And we have to mentor people. We have to sell the department and sell the career and sell the job. So just to go back on my, the second part of that question, mm -hmm. if I apologize. you don't know if you're- I simply would win. Um, we really have our short on time because we have a bill presentation after this and I have a number of questions left. Okay. Um, but if you do have additional questions, please make sure that you meet with them after, and then we can also have the committee send them out. So if you want to just send them our way, um, we can ask for that clarity and just send them out and then get it to all the members of the committee. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Thank you so much. Cecilia Gonzalez, District 16 for the record. Um, again, number of questions. Thank you so much for your presentations, but I'll keep it short and focus on one of my questions. Um, you mentioned that your use of force policy updates depending on um, incidents. So I was just curious if you could maybe speak to the most recent incident that occurred that made you all change your policy. What did that look like? Kind of just details of how that works. And then you also mentioned that it's a national policy um, with de-escalation, community policing. So I was just curious more so if you could just go into a little more detail in what that looks like and what makes it a national policy. What is it that you're doing that is attracting national, um, you know, standards, if you will. Thank you so much. Beth Schmidt, for the record. Um, our policy and procedure is constantly changing. And this is something where, and when that, when that happens, that is pushed out electronically. We, we, have, a, we have a portal that we, we all have to go into and read, and there are tests. And you, you, so you know the new policy. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I need just a, and I'm going to try and chair be as brief as I can and concise as I can. Um, if you can just ask that a, again, I'm I just. Cecilia Gonzalez, District 16, for the record. So in your presentation, when discussing use of force, um, you stated that it was a national policy, right? Um, that other, that you were on a national platform for, for this policy. And then you stated that when infractions happen, so when you have incidents with use of force with officers, you 
then take that internally and review it and then change your policy. So I was just curious, like, what is your use of force policy? What are the de-escalation tactics you're using? Just maybe a little more detail. And then also follow up, if it's changing so often, how are you all training officers um, so that they are on the most updated policy and where do they find that? Thank you. Beth Schmidt for the record. We require supervisory presence and leadership. So it's not an excuse to say I didn't read the policy. I don't understand the policy. That is done at a, at, at, out in briefings. That is done in conversations as soon as policy changes. Um, and what are some of the things we do? I mean, let, let's talk about, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Three years ago, George Floyd. How does something like that happen? And then how three years later does Tyree Nichols murdered, pulled out of a car and murdered? How does that happen? And what we do is we look at those incidences, but we also look at our own incidences to say, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? One of the things that we, we, we throw the word around a lot is de-escalation. De-escalation is, look, it, it is, at times it is very scary to be a cop, to come up on these situations. You aren't born with this confidence. You aren't born with this innate ability to approach these situations. Oftentimes, myself, as a patrol supervisor, I would get up on the radio and say, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Slow down. And, and that's part of, I mean, that's a literal part of trying to just trigger people and remind them to slow down, think about what you're doing, gather the resources, don't force the situation. So that's sort of the mindset that we come from. And, and all of those discussions are on a daily basis. Because no one gets up in the morning wanting to hurt someone else. We want to do the right thing. And what we have found is incorporating de-escalation has been critical to changing policing nationwide. But we see that we are, yes, we are a leader when it comes to use of force. However, what we see in incidences across the country where people die is that that is not universal. Not everyone is embracing this and training this, but we continue to try and be one of the, the gold standards and other nations, or other, other departments come to us. If I can jump in as well, it's Chris Reese for the record, R-I-E-S. Assemblywoman, the, uh, our use of force policy is always on our website, lvmpd.com, um, as long, I'm sorry, as well as a five-year use of force uh, report. So we update that um, every year for the previous five years for uses of force um, complaints and whatnot. So you can, uh, on top of doing reports, um, you can look at that. And if we could get a copy of those sent to the committee as well, just for easy convenience for, to the members of the committee. Um, so that report as well as the policy. Uh, of course, thanks. Thank you. Um, I have Assemblyman Hibbets, then Assemblywoman Taylor, then Assemblywoman Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Very quickly, do you know your vacancy rate for commissioned officers? Beth Schmidt, for the record, I do not. Um, but it is not good. And we are down hundreds at this point. Uh, and I don't want to give you the wrong number on that. I, I understand that it is changing. Um, it is incredibly important to our sheriff to fill those spots because we can't properly police our community. No, I shouldn't say we can't properly. We, we need those officers to achieve what we're trying to achieve in the community. Uh, it when you get those numbers, could you provide them to the committee staff, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Assemblyman Thomas? It's okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was concerned about time. Um, we, we don't have floor today. I just don't want to keep you all for five hours for the committee. <laughs> I think we could grill you all all day if we wanted. <laughs> Thank you um, again for the presentation and some of your answers that you've shared with us. My quick question actually has to do with budget technology and, um, you know, for personal disclosure, um, at one time I worked for the uh, district attorney's office and this question happens to be a concern that I have that Las Vegas um, Police Metro um, 
does charge about $280 for per hour um, fee for body cam. And um, what I, what my question is, is actually for um, this service, um, you give the DA's office along with the PD's office, this is free. And I don't know if this is because of statute or not, but for the general public, um, me as a citizen, and I want, um, you know, uh, you know, footage of what happened, whatever incident, I have to pay $280 per hour for that. Uh, when did this policy happen and why? Chris Reese, for the record, uh, thank you for the comment or the question, Assemblywoman. Um, I'm not quite sure when the policy became uh, effective. I do know that we update that policy. Um, I believe in July we update the, the, the monetary cost of it. I will say that the, the unredacted version of the video does get taken to the PDs and the, and the DAs. The issue comes in when uh, a citizen requests it, then we do have to redact that footage. You know, in good conscience, we can't show the inside of somebody's house or um, birth dates. So the redaction of it is what costs the money. We have a squ uh, two squads with two sergeants, lieutenants. You know, the, 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 the fees are, are, are there because it costs us quite a bit of money. Um, we also have civilian staff that can do um, reports and whatnot. So um, we welcome any feedback. If there's any way that we can uh, save money for, for the department and for the citizen, we, we certainly welcome that feedback. Um, and we're, we're, we're always welcome to uh, um, feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Assemblyman Taylor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I noticed on one of the slides you, you talked to, and proudly, about being one of the first, especially large agencies, to, to em embrace um, body cameras and so on. And I certainly want to applaud you for that. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, uh, do you audit that footage at all, like, like for compliance or, um, you know, that they're actually being used in any, any kind of auditing in place? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. All three of us have worn body-worn cameras. Um, I will tell you that when you first wear it, and I started in that trial process, um, the first couple days you're aware of it, and after that you're not. Um, and you just do your job. Uh, yes, there is, there is an auditing process. And we also have a standard of what percentage rate we expect that officer to use, use the camera. Because there are times when it, it, it needs to be turned off. Um, we have a, a robust policy on body-worn camera. We are above our percentage of what we, what we hold our officers to. We're, we are actually above that. And I, I don't want to misquote the numbers, but I will tell you that I will get those to you. And as far as going through the footage, uh, sort of, we don't, we don't go through them. We do have a policy about that, that we don't just willy-nilly go through the body-worn camera. It, the cameras are really used m mainly in that regard. It, it kind of accomplishes the same, which is in internal affairs. They spend, and I was there when the cameras started coming in, and it really changed the way that we conducted our internal affairs. Because the reality is, if the citizen alleges you did it, and what you did is a violation of our policy, that is black and white. You did it. And, and we are thankful to have those cameras to help us hold people accountable. But at the same time, sometimes we find that what was alleged did not occur. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Duran. Good, afternoon. Good morning, and thank you for your uh, report. It was very informative. Um, during the 21 legislative session, this committee asked about the relationship with Metro and immigration had, to, had and with the contracts exist. We were told that there was no formal agreements and there was no formal communication between the law enforcement and ICE. However, over the last year, we have seen different reports regarding the role in deportation. So can you clarify um, what the relationship is with ICE? And you know, sometimes on the trail, campaign trail, there's, um, that statement can differ. So we would like to know what your official stance on that is, please. I thank you for that question, and I'll be very honest with you. I am new in this position. 
My name is Beth Schmidt, for the record. I'll be very honest with you. I, I am new into this position, and, I, and this is an incredibly important point. And what I want to do is, we, we don't have a relationship with ICE. They, they're not in our jail. But let, let, me, let me get an, a, a clear answer for you and a clear statement. Would that, would that suffice? I don't want to just say what I think. I want to say what I know. And I do need to consult. We haven't, you know, with, with, our, with our agency. Yes, that would be fine. And okay. thank you for that. I think because we do have so many visitors from out of state, and it's not only just the citizens that live in Las Vegas, but it's, it also affects the um, visitors that come to Vegas as well. Thank you. Thank you. And if we could just add to that request that we get a copy of any formal contracts, procedures, if there is no formal contract, what that looks like. Because when we have individuals on the campaign trail saying that they're responsible for the deportations of thousands of individuals, but that this body testified in Assembly Government Affairs in the 21 session and said that they played no role, that there was no interaction, there's clearly some miscommunication. I want to identify exactly where that is because it's unfair to this committee that this department can come to this committee and say one thing is occurring, but we're hearing a different thing from our constituencies. We're hearing a different thing on the campaign trail. And so our expectation is that this is a relationship of trust and that this department comes to this committee to speak honestly about what's happening. And I understand that you all weren't here during that session. It wasn't you all uh, that were the face of this organization. But it, uh, additionally, like I think it's just frustrating as a legislator when you're trying to create policy that, makes, uh, that, that impacts the state and for this department to come and make a fool of this committee, which is what happened in 2021, and I hope it never happens again. So we, uh, if we can get all of that information, that would be very helpful. Chair Torres, absolutely, we will get you that. I am the face of the agency here and I will get you that information. Thank you. At this time, um, I don't believe there's any other questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. We do appreciate it, um, and I look forward to continuing to work with you in this com committee. All right, so our next... Next on our agenda is AB 82, uh, which designates World Esports Day as a day of observance in this state. And we're very excited to invite Assemblywoman Erica Mosca um, to come present. And I do know that we have the CEO of Vegas Inferno on Zoom, Mr. Michael Cox. If you want to go ahead and join us, I believe that you'll be assisting in the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Great to see everybody today. This is my first one, so I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Chair Torres, Vice Chair Duran, and members of the committee. I'm excited to be here today to present on Assembly Bill 82. I will provide a brief introduction, and then I'm going to yield to my colleagues who represent the three constituent groups that this bill is coming from. Young people, industry, and families. We're simply asking for a day to recognize esports in our state. As someone who believes deeply in student voice and advocacy and has done my work in education for the past 15 years, I'm proud that AB 82 is my constituent bill uh, and gives legitimacy to those who are supporting young people creatively in ways that most relate to them and that support intentional workforce development. I'm also proud to support my district in East Las Vegas, where you'd be surprised to know houses one of the largest esports businesses, genre sportswear, here in Nevada. So what is esports? I had to get that answer, too, when I started this a few months ago. My colleagues define esports as the pinnacle spot for current and future pipeline of the video game workforce. K-12 from Clark to Churchill, to Washoe, and Northern and Southern Nevada colleges have students who are playing video games as a team sport, gaining workforce development, and winning scholarships. So yes, I know it sounds strange promoting video game usage and even asking for a day in Nevada to align to World Esports Day, but the education and the community that come from this sport are inspirational and empowering young Nevadans with productive, team-based extracurricular activities with positive outcomes. 
This bill establishes a day of observance and there are currently 27 in our state. These days are brought forward to bring awareness to fellow Nevadans. And if you've already learned something new today, that's why we're asking for this day, to bring awareness to an asset that exists within our community. So thank you, and I'll yield to my colleague, Hugh Lee, who is at Grant Sawyer. Hopefully. <laughs> I'm here. Hello, committee members and honorable chair, and thank you for having me speak, including the amazing Assemblywoman Mosca. My name is Hugh Lee, H-I-E-U-L-E -E for the committee secretary, um, and I am president and founder of the Nevada Esports Education League, which is Nevada's only student-based nonprofit currently. We're not here to support or against the recognition of the Esports Day Bill, but we are here to bring grassroots data of the Nevada Esports from the previous years. Esports is more than competitive gaming, as Assemblywoman said, it is community education, workforce development, and STEM building for Nevada economics. Our statewide data that we have currently is that over 165,000 members within the community all over Nevada, from ages 15 to 50, males and females, over all diversities, have been interested in esports and have participated in it. Nevada has also 60 plus local esports organizations ranging from colleges, high schools, businesses, such as the one that Assemblyman mentioned, um, and local government. 45 high schools around the Las Vegas area are involved in local esports leagues and 12 are within the Northern Nevada community. We even have one in Elko at Great Basin Community College um, that participates in esports. By having this day, we can see huge growth in education for esports. We also support five national esports events, such as the Amazon Invent Esports Bar Association and CES that is home to Nevada. Finally, we have fundraised about $21,000 through video games and esports with local charities during the COVID-19 pandemic online. Nevada Esports Education League and Neil participating in Esports City Summit, Pokemon Go Clean Up the Parks, Northern Nevada Break the Internet, and we see huge growth over the next year of 100,000 esports participants in Nevada. With that being said, I yield to Michael Cox, who is online. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. And first and foremost, I just wanted to thank uh, you all on behalf of Las Vegas Inferno for allowing me to present and contribute for uh, this bill for the state of Nevada for the official esports day. For, uh, for the record, my name is Michael Cox, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, C-O-X. I, I apologize, Mr. And uh, Mr. The Cox. Of the record, uh, Mr. Cox, are you on Zoom? If you would like to put your... Yes, I am. I, I invite you to just make sure your camera is on. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. I am on the phone version oh, of Zoom. Okay, not a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just for the correction of the record, too, I am the COO, the Chief Operations Officer, and co owner of Las Vegas Inferno. Our involvement here today, on behalf of the many contributors here today presenting for the bill in question, is to tell present you the first and state. Uh, we are the first homegrown and professional esports organization founded within the city of Las Vegas. It is our priority since the inception of our organization was to bring a wide range of professional and career opportunities to our community through the means of esports and content creation. With the inception of Esports Day for the state of Nevada, LVI will strive and provide and make public even more the endless possibilities within our many diverse and rich communities through the future and proof st uh, the future proof status that is the esports and content creation industry that is overwhelming the current workforce today in today's modern industry. Our many direct relationships with the ed educational institutions, communities, and charity organizations within the city of Las Vegas and the tens to hundreds of thousands of direct community members of our own through many individual platforms, such as Twitter to Discord, who have such a super diverse range of fans and loyal community members of many diverse uh, communities, such as Latina, Asians, and many of those being between uh, women and men through a higher percentage of women actually within our community. 
As Las Vegas Inferno strives to become a staple performing organization in its entirety of esports, our main priority is to bring the foundation to the city of Las, uh, Las Vegas to become the esports capital of the world. With uh, that comes more economic and career opportunities, and internally, LVI wishes to be the biggest contributor of those expansions with the many projects we have on deck over our next five years. In conclusion, our goal is to facilitate those who have uh, become professional gamers at the top of the pyramid, but we also wish for those who are pursuing traditional education routes to have flexible options within the esports industry. For example, if you're going to marketing for a degree or if you're going for a traditional graphic design degree, we want to facilitate and showcase that even those routes can lead into a career and a home within the esports industry. And perhaps, as LVI would like to take into consideration, future employment with our own organization. Again, thank you for the opportunity to present our case to you, and I yield my time to my colleague, Edward Thompson. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Edward Thompson. Edward Wells Thompson, excuse me. Uh, Edward E D W A R D Wells W E L L S Thompson T H O M P S O N. I would like to thank Assemblywoman Mosca for the opportunity to speak today. I'm speaking to you from a personal place this morning in regards to esports. As a husband and a father of five boys, I experience firsthand how esports help my children manage through the pandemic. If you have children, we can all relate with the idea that each child is different. Different, in, different interest in clothing, music, food, and hobbies. But the common denominator for my house, my household, has been esports. During the pandemic, we used the time to compete, socialize, or just spend time with one another. Our boys used, used it as a means to also build communities with others all around the world that were going through various challenges during the pandemic. It helped them cope with the madness. The community of, uh, of young men and women built through the pandemic, they still talk to to this day. I also work at the City of Las Vegas as a Workforce Development Specialist, YDSI program. I develop programs that create opportunities for young adults and adults by training and providing new career opportunities in various fields. One of the career fields I have a true passion for would be esports and the transferable skills that come from it. In the underserved neighborhoods I serve, esports has brought hope and opportunity to our young men and women in this community of bright individuals. Just as sports, and music was used as a means to change the, tra the trajectory of their lives from negative to positive. Esports has become that means to a positive change, not just in the area of competing, but in the transferable skills learned in this career field. The transferable skills such as teamwork, leadership, communication, strategic thinking, problem solving, decision making, analytic skills, cyber skills, the ability to multitask, Dexterity, improving processing ability, improving reaction times. Again, hope and opportunity. Esports has provided more than just an avenue to kill time. It's helped save lives. Thank you for your time. Thank you, um, and I believe that concludes the presentation. I see Asalu and Mosca is shaking her head yes. So at this time, I'll go ahead and open it for any questions from the committee members. Uh, Supplement Koenig. So they mentioned earlier that esports affects from the ages of five to fifty, and I'm a little bit older than that. And my son and my son-in-law played all the time, and they've talked me into playing. And it's a good way for me to get with, together with them, even spread out throughout this, you know, United States. We can get together and do this. And just want to say I have a pretty mean NASA's top lane, and I've got a pretty good blitz crank to support. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Someone from MacArthur, you look like you wanted to comment on eSports as well? No, he doesn't think so. I think he's still working through the definition of eSports. <laughs> Any additional members of the committee? 
So I will actually ask you if you could just uh, clarify or expand a little bit more on the definition of esports, so we can kind of know exactly what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and to you too, Member Koenig, thank you, and I learned something new about you. Uh, but uh, for this, that's a very good question, Chair, because there are two different type of esports, and that's important to understand. The one piece of legislation that came last session was for the gaming esports. This is different, so if you know the HyperX Arena there, that's gambling. This is really for young people who play video games, and then they have a tournament. So if you've ever played Mario Kart at home, and you you then now play it streaming together, you can actually compete against each other. So young people have come together with thousands of people, um, according to my colleague uh, down south, and they compete against each other. So it's a video game tournament, and at the co collegiate level they do it as well, and a great item that comes from it are scholarships. So winners usually win scholarship money. Thank you. I'm hoping that there's an eSport day at the legislature sometime soon so we all get to play. I know uh, Assemblyman MacArthur and I were going to race at Mario Kart. Uh, I think I can beat him even though he's been driving for forever. I don't believe, <laughs> I don't believe there's any additional questions from this committee. All right, so we'll go ahead and open it up for individuals coming, wishing to testify in support here in, in Carson City and then in Las Vegas. When you're ready, you may begin. Just a reminder, you'll have two minutes um, for those wishing to testify in support, opposition, and neutral. Um, and additionally, just make sure you say your name and spell your name for the record. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Raymond Wu, R-A-Y-M-O-N-D, last name W-U. So I am a political science major at the University of Nevada, Reno. And I'm in support of this bill because eSports was able to provide me with not only competition, but a community to be a part of when I did not have one in school. So like, um, as everyone knows, imagine that typical kid, like the last pick in a basketball game, the one that was always picked on, the brunt of every joke, um, the, the kid in the back of the classroom. I was pretty much that kid, and when I had no place to turn in school, I turned to esports games like CSGO and League of Legends. I was able to find basically, instead of being the last pick, I was always one of the first. I was recognized for my skills instead of being bullied. I was be able to become somebody when in school I was a nobody. And I was able to find some of the greatest people I've ever met in my life who are still some of my closest friends now through this community I was able to build up through this process through eSports. And uh, this community is only starting to grow, right? I started off in middle school and back then nobody really knew about eSports and now I'm talking about that, about eSports in the Nevada legislature. So like, imagine how many other kids like me who were able to find a home, a community, a group of friends, a sense of belonging, that I was able to go through this process, how many more people in the state of Nevada are gonna be able to go through that, and how important it is for them to have a day to recognize their skills, their dedication, and their passion, right? We don't have a Super Bowl, we don't have the NBA Finals, but we can have this day for ourselves, at least within this state. So that's why I believe this bill may seem minute to a lot of people, but for those who truly care about it, it, it would mean the world for them, so that's why it was with the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, next. Uh, hello, Assembly Committee of Government Affairs. My name is Lorenzi de Santos, L O R E N Z I T A, Santos, S A N T O S, and I am speaking on behalf of the Asian American Pacific Islander Democratic Caucus in support of AB 82. Um, I want to say that our organization is dedicated to maximizing the participation of uh, Nevada's vibrant Asian Pacific Islander community and is a powerful force in elections in all levels of political processes. So you might be asking why am I talking about this? Well, um, through our continued outreach and collaborations with API small businesses, restaurants, and organizations, we actually got to know a lot of folks um, and their personal stories that esports plays a critical and cultural role and educational role for many of our community members. And even during the election, our organization has worked with partners to mobilize events around the esports community for the election. So by recognizing Esports Day as a state holiday, we, rec we recognize the impact of esports in our community. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. Paul Moratkin, P -A -L -U -P 
P-A-U-L-M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N. I'm the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for the Vegas Chamber. First, I'd like to thank the bill sponsor for bringing the bill forward. The Chamber is in support of AB 82. As many of you know, the Chamber, of course, is heavily involved with tourism in our community, and we believe that this is a growing segment in the tourism sector as we continue to diversify what that definition means in Clark County and throughout the state. As you've heard from the subject matter experts and the students, it is also a place of community from the engage, build with the communities, and also also to contribute and grow and become stronger in their in their personal aspects of their life. We believe uh, this is a, a great option for our community as we move forward and strengthen that role as tourism and provide another segment of our population to engage in our tourism sector. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dr. Mary Prusinski, P-I-E-R-C-Z-Y-N-S-K-I, -E and I represent the Nevada Association of School Superintendents, and we're in support of this bill. It, uh, you've heard all the good things that eSports do for young people, and uh, it's a niche for some of our uh, students who uh, have um, not excelled in football and basketball and baseball and all these other things. So uh, we uh, appreciate that this bill has been brought forward and the proclamation will draw attention to eSports. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to testify in support of AB 82 here in Carson City? In Las Vegas, is there anyone? It doesn't appear that there's any additional people in the room to speak in support of AB 82 in Las Vegas, just confirming. BPS, is there anyone on the phones wishing to testify in support of AB 82? To testify in support of AB 82, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Again, press star nine to take your place in the queue. Hi, committee. Um, I, I'm sorry if you can hear me correctly. Yes, please proceed. Okay, perfect. Uh, my name is Roy Fiston. Uh, for the record, it's spelled R O I space T R I S T A N. I am currently a UNLV grad student um, attending UNLV for the MBA program. I'm from Pemberley District 16. I'd like to say I'm in full support of the bill purely because we have a simple issue that could be solved by you know, recognizing esports in the state purely because we are fighting for support. And as everybody else before me stated that in all the good that we do, our good could be doubled if we are recognized officially by the state. And to be honest, what better way than uh, to get visibility is to a proclamation. So if we, if this bill is passed, then it's going to be significantly helping us get more visibility, which means we can climb an inch, or maybe a foot, closer to the national stage. Um, so moving forward, if this bill is passed, and hopefully it will be, our visibility will be increased and will be helped uh, in our efforts towards spreading the goodwill and the good work uh, of the esports community. That affects everybody, everybody in the uh, state, including small businesses. Uh, large corporations, pretty much anybody that uh, works in the entertainment industry can see the benefits and the good that the esports community does. That is all. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hello, this is uh, Jairo Orcuyo, J A I R O U R C U Y O. I just want to make sure you guys can hear me. Yes, please proceed. Perfect. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of Las Vegas Inferno, the official esports team in Las Vegas. Um, I wanted to call in and testify on the behalf of the bill. I definitely think it's a great idea. This is something that we've been striving for for the past three years from our mission statement in the workforce, whether it be from graphic designing, uh, photography. I come from the, uh, from CSN myself, graduated Sierra Vista here all locally in Las Vegas, found esports as a passion, and it actually took me into college itself. So if I wouldn't have found esports, I would have never went to college in the first place. So I think it's very important to develop esports in Nevada, um, even more now that we're doing this, uh, and bring in the next generation and help guide them into the right career path, the community, and keep supporting the community as a whole. And uh, that's all I wanted to say on my behalf. 
Thank you. Next caller, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Gennaro Villo. I'm a computer science student at UNLV. I'm supporting this bill because eSports has changed my life multiple times. Sir, would you be able to One spell your name is, for the uh, record, please? Oh, it's G-E-N-A-R-O. I'm supporting this bill because eSports has changed my life multiple times. First of all, it has given me a lot of social skills. It really helped me out to speak more with people, get more friends, uh, improve the way I, I behave with other people. It also, playing video games, I have gained very important economic support to be able to continue my education. Also teach me how STEM is a very important field that I want to keep on track. That's what I'm studying computer science. Thank you. Thank you. And do you mind, I, I have the one name, Gennaro. It, I don't know if you have the your first name or last name. Excuse me? Uh, can you just, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I think you, uh, we have your first name, Gennaro, but we need your last name. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Grillo. G-R-I-L-L-O. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, next Thank caller. You. Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no additional callers in support at this time. Thank you. I will now open it up for anybody wishing to testify in opposition to AB 82 here in Carson City. I don't see anyone. Anyone in Las Vegas? BPS, is there anyone on the line wishing to testify in opposition to AB 82? To testify in opposition of AB 82, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to testify neutral to AB 82 here in Carson City? I don't see any in Las Vegas. And BPS, is there anyone wishing to testify in neutral to AB 82? To testify in neutral of AB 82, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers for neutral at this time. Thank you. Any closing remarks? Assemblyman Mosca. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to thank the committee for listening and learning. I also want to thank. And could you please state oh, your name? Oh, sorry. For Erica Mosca, E R I C A M O S C A, for the record. I just want to thank the committee. Uh, uh, thank you all for listening and learning, and also thank all of the supporters who took time to participate, especially our young people who are showing what's possible for our state. And I'll just leave you with the World Esports Day was established in Europe, and if Nevada has a proclamation, we will be the first state to adopt. So thank you so much for considering. Thank you. I will now close the hearing on AB 82. At this point, we will go ahead and open up for public comment. Each person has two minutes to provide testimony. Public comment may be submitted in writing to the committee up to 24 hours after the hearing. Is there anyone in person wishing to give public comment here in Las Vegas? And in Carson City, is there anyone wishing to give public comment? Or, I'm sorry, in Las Vegas or Carson City? I might have one. Yes, you may go. Yes. Okay, uh, this is Hugh Lee. Um, his first name is H I E U. His last name is spelled L E. Uh, just wanted to say, from being an intern in 2019 and cleaning a popcorn machine in the third floor of the legislative building to working as an attache in the assembly district, um, and now as a community member and just myself here, it's very unreal to be here. And thank you again to the amazing assembly committee. Thank you, Mr. Lee. It's always good to see you. Is there any additional public comment in Las Vegas? Seeing none, BPS, is there anyone wishing to testify in public comment? 
To provide public comment, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Ian Marie Grant, my brother Thomas Purdy was murdered by Reno police in Marshall County Sheriff's Office. I have some real questions and I'd like answers to in data, like how many people have died in their custody, how many pending lawsuits does the sheriff's office have against it? How many internal affairs complaints have been filed against deputies and their outcomes? How many fatal and non-fatal shootings have the agency's been involved in why aren't law enforcement and deputies randomly drug tested that would be some real accountability because police can basically kill without consequence but aren't randomly drug tested law enforcement doesn't forget homicide victims just the ones they have killed themselves where was the humanity shown to my 140 pound soaking wet mentally ill nonviolent brother by washoe county sheriff's office as far as LVMPD providing a preliminary report to the public, it's actually a tactic they use to criminalize the victim and get their narrative out to, to turn the court of public opinion in their favor immediately, as we all know a dead person can't defend themselves, just like my brother can't defend themselves, and that's why I advocate for him and others every single day. If this committee is angered by law enforcement telling lies, imagine them asphyxiating your loved one, and then telling you he just suddenly stopped breathing and died, only to find out the truth months and months later from a public records request. No mention he was hard tied or had multiple deputies on his back and neck when he suddenly stopped breathing. Thank you. Thank you, next caller. Chair, the public line is open and working, but we have no additional callers at this time. Thank you, members, any remarks? Just a reminder to community members, we will be meeting on Monday at 10 a.m. So we'll have a little bit of a late start this President's Day. So we are meeting at 10 a.m. One moment. And we will be, we were just confirming with the changing meeting rooms, but we will be meeting in here on Monday, so room 3143. Um, so we will see you all here on Monday at 10 a.m. At this time, the meeting is adjourned.